I'm Dr. Lisa Coleman, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, and I use she and her pronouns. I hope that everyone is taking very good care. We're thrilled to work to welcome you to our Transformation Talk series, where we spotlight leaders to learn from their journeys and gain knowledge about how to be agents working toward transformational change across our organizations. In OGI, we engage global diversity and inclusion principles with an intersectional focus on nimbleness, inclusivity, resilience, transformation, growth mindsets, design thinking, and adaptivity across all of our work. Transformation Talks is a part of NYU's Be Together initiative centered on innovating and acting and transforming together. Today, we have the distinct honor to welcome Pro Professor Lisette Nieves. It is an honor to have you with us here today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Coleman. It's an honor to be here in conversation with you. Thank you. Dr. Nieves is currently the president of the Fund for the City of New York, FCNY, an institution charged with developing and helping to implement innovations in policy, programs, practices, technology, in order to advance the functioning of government and nonprofit organizations in New York City and beyond. Key FCNY programs include the Cash Flow Loan Program, the Partnership Program, and the Sloan Public Service Awards. Prior to the fund, Dr. Nieves was the director of the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies and a full clinical professor at NYU Steinhardt, where she co-led the design and implementation of a new doctoral program in leadership and innovation, and has also taught organizational theory and behavior and educational policy analysis. analysis excuse me. Dr. Navis is also a distinguished clinical instructor within NYU, overseeing doctoral students and supporting research initiatives. She holds a BA from Brooklyn College, a BA MA from the University of Oxford, and an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Her doctorate with distinction in higher education is from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Truman Scholar, a Rhodes Scholar, an Aspen Paraha Fellow, and a Richard P. Nathan Public Policy Fellow. For over 25 years, Dr. Navis has served in a variety of cross-sector leadership positions. She's an experienced social entrepreneur, public sector leader, and of course, rigorous scholar. She founded the Lingo Ventures, which focused on growth, talent, and recruitment, retention, and change management. She has also served as the Bell Zeller Distinguished Visiting Professor in Public Policy at the City University of New York at Brooklyn College. Most recently, she served as an Obama appointee as the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, where she co-chaired the Higher Education Subcommittee and supported the production of two reports and convenings. Dr. Nieves has also served as the founding executive director of Europe, New York, and in an innovative workforce development program. And the span over the span of five years, she grew the organization from a 250,000 seed grant to six to a six million dollar operation with over 20 corporate partnerships. Her interest in the workforce and education has led to her dissertation on the relationship between student work and school roles, for which she received the 2016 Dissertation of the Year Award by the NCSD-AACC. Her areas of interest include community colleges, college pathways, workforce and education partnerships, which are all represented in her co-authored book, Working to Learn, Disrupting the Divide Between College and Career Pathways for Young People. Her board affiliations include the Edwin Gould Foundation, AVID, the Education Trust, New Schools Venture Fund, Jobs for the Future, and a trustee of the New York Public Library. She served as the founding director of the Gutman Community College Foundation Board. To say that she is one of our premier scholars, as we see, is an understatement. And again, we are truly delighted to have you join us for this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. 
I'm going to jump right in and start off with the question that I like to start with each for each one of our get transformation guests. As a highly accomplished and respected leader and change agent, how do you think about success and transformation within the context of thinking about global leadership? Well, it's a, it, I love that question. And I think, let me start with the global leadership piece, which is when I think about transformation and success, I think about this idea of interdependency, that whatever decision that you make, that there are others that if you are not conscious of being inclusive, if you don't have an equity mindset around it, you could have very strong unintended consequences for some decisions you make. So for me, when I think about success, I think about it as that we are interdependent um, and thus we should have a process that recognizes that. When I think about it, success as an individual, I always say, um, for me, the best way that you can do well is for your team to do well, right? Like I, I feel so strong about that. Um, there is a point where you realize the best part of your work is the work that's gonna be done through others. And that is a wonderful liberating experience. It's also a humbling experience, but it's one that's truly about transformation. One person does not transform, it's a collective. So that's, that's how I would look at it. Well, thank you so much. And it kind of is gonna lead us into our next question because of that idea of interdependency and that we can't do things and that our best work actually is through others. And so, in thinking about that, in our work across the university's campuses, disciplines, fields, et cetera, we are really thinking about how um, we support right, global leaders. Yes. And I know you're thinking about that in your work, yes. particularly through the fund, but I know you've also thought about mm -hmm. it as your role as a professor in our, our Steinhardt School of, of, of Education. And so really thinking about that, what are some of the core strengths that you would think about in terms of thinking about leadership, right? As we think about this interdependency, what are some of the core strengths that are needed to enable our global leaders to grow and rename, remain nimble and agile? And also, right, attentive to the very issues that you mentioned earlier, equity, diversity, inclusion. Yeah, you know, one of the things is that I think it's so important that we reclaim the history and narrative of what leadership means right? Because it is a narrowly defined one as we understand it right now, right? So for example, at the role at the fund, I'm proud to be involved in what I think is the recovery of New York City and its nonprofits, which is a sector that has been built by women and a lot of the labor of women of color, right? And yet so often when we talk about leadership and recovery, that's not necessarily the image or the narrative that we have represented in these conversations. And so for me, when I think about that, so one is always remembering that people are carrying schemas of what leadership means. And if it was from traditional education, it is going to be exclusionary to my detriment, to your detriment, to other women of color's detriment. And so, um, so I always want to ground folks in really understanding that leadership is much broader than we know of it historically. Um, or recognize leadership. I think when we think about transformation and the nimbleness that's there, I think this idea of constantly translating and shifting environments and context is necessary. And this is where if we really accepted the assets of underrepresented communities, we'd see that they probably do that the most, right? So this idea of nimbleness, this idea of creativity, this idea, like it's, I always say that's where we start and that's where I think we, we have a, a great advantage in some ways, right? In <laughs> um, the work that I do at the fund, like I said, that's great that I could do that with nonprofits and support the great work of them. When I think about the work at, that I've done at NYU in creating a doctorate in leadership and innovation is that this is where you can have a research one institution support these incredible executives that are doing major transformative initiatives. And they're able for the first time to kind of breathe and think intellectually as well as socially, culturally, and everything else around the intentions of that initiative in a way that we don't often get to do in our traditional everyday leadership. 
So I love that because I do think there's a piece of, as I said, going slower is a hard thing to do when we are so used to getting it done. <laughs> right. right? That's absolutely and right. So sometimes going slower actually allows us to be more intentional and more conscious in a way that um, I think has a better result. So that's what I love when we could bring the best of the academy together with the best of these incredible executive and practitioners and do some important transformative work. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that doctorate, for creating it. I think that's exactly right. And space and these things of creating these spaces where people can come together and rethink things like leadership, right? Rethink and break open those molds that you talked about. And of course, we know that the best of, of education is where we can actually do those, those kinds of things. So, yeah. so and I, and I want to say this, I mean, I know that this is a, that this is about interviewing me, but I want to say, Dr. Coleman, I'm thankful for you because this is how you have looked at this office. You've not looked at it as an appendage. You've not looked at it as an ornament. You've made it real and applicable and intellectual and connected in the way that I don't always see. And I just appreciate you for that. Well, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. You know, I have to say, I think, in, in your words, in, in t- even talking about the doctorate, right? It's really important to bring that research. Yes. So because sometimes we have to think and slow down, mm-hmm. even as we're creating, doing innovation, right? And as and as executives and practitioners, as you said, sometimes they don't have that opportunity to That's slow right. down. And so this kind of partnership with higher ed allows those efforts to come forward. And the other thing I just really want to underscore, and I do appreciate you saying that about the work, is that one of the things I think we've tried to do in our work, and I know that you've done in your work, is really think about this asset model. And I'm glad that you said that, right? And to move out of this idea of deficit, there are problems, to be sure, right? And there are problems that we have to address, but to approach everything as a deficit and not see the assets that, um, these our communities have to offer is a tremendous disservice. And I think as we think about moving forward in terms of leadership, you're absolutely right in terms of thinking about those assets. And and, and I would say as, as a Latina that when I got it, that I embraced what I thought was a deficit as my secret weapon, what it all (laughs) changed for me, right? I was like, yes, Yes, you're right. You know what? I I am bilingual. I am bicultural. I am this. I am that. Right. And so I think like when I really got that's what that's what makes me special. Oh, it changed. It changed my outlook completely. (laughs) Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that's exactly that's right. Spot on. Exactly. And especially for some of our uh, our emerging generation out there and yes. our emerging leaders to, to really think about that for themselves. So that leads me to our next question, actually. And so I have this friend uh, and she makes me laugh when she asks this, this question. She asks leaders, what would your eight year old self think of yourself today? And so and then and in that thinking about the arc of your leadership, right? Some of the challenges that you've navigated yeah. and then some of the things you're most proud of. So it's a, kind of yeah. a three part question, but thinking about that eight year old yeah. self, challenges, what you're proud of and what would that eight year old think of yourself today? <laughs> wow. You know, it's interesting because it was at nine years old, I confronted um, overt, kind of bias, right? I'm just gonna call it what it was, right? Um, Of course, we understood it at other moments of time, but I remember doing exceptionally well on a school-wide math exam. Mm -hmm. And I was that student that loved school, that loved learning. And I thought my teacher was going to compliment me because I had kind of a chaotic home a little bit, right? So school was a centering place, not for everybody, but that's my narrative. And so, when I realized when she was probing and her questions, it was wondering if I was, if I cheated on the exam and I'll never forget that. And I just remember feeling crushed, right? I remember what that was like. And I remember going home and I remember, you know, my dad and his unfiltered way was very classic about it, which was 
this is the world, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't, you know, I could, I could go down the whole list, right? Very nonchalant. We love you. You're going to have to do X more than Y, whatever, right? Like we yeah. and, and do it twice as fast, twice oh, as better. Twice as, oh, twice yeah, as yeah. fast, twice as hard. Right. And it just, and look, I hadn't known that because I, I was always around people who work so hard every day and maybe never reap the benefits they should have. Right. I'm just like, like I was around that, but this kind of hit me because I really was in that fantasy of in school, if you work the hardest, you're going to get the, you know what I mean? And I did it. And so I remember at that age that you say that I was in a real crisis of, am I going to be seen for me intellectually? Right. So now to like go now, how many years later, my eight-year-old self would be like, go on with your bad self. You're not hung (laughs) up on that. Congratulations. And that, that to, that to really own and understand your voice, you are going to make some people, you're going to make people uncomfortable. That's right. Right. And so don't pride yourself on that. Um, pride yourself on your champions, not on your critics. Right. And so it was a, so the journey, when I think about just from that beginning, I kind of, you know, I laugh at it and, and you know, Dr. Come, you know, this, you, you have tons of academic accolades too, but well, people are still surprised that like, we're literate. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when yes, you walk in the room and people are still like, doctor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, so there was a part of me where, and now I kind of laugh at it, you know, now I'm like, but I just, but then I realized I was like, wow. You know, I, I tell my eight year old self every time I walk into a room, particularly rooms that are, have seated power, mm-hmm that I know that I have power to make change, right? And that um, versus being there to sit back, I feel there's some kind of ownership or commitment I have to some change. I guess the last thing I think about what I would say to, what my eight-year-old self would say to me is that um, I kind of knew I was always independent and I stayed true to that like really not apologetic about when I needed to just be independent. And I think even then confronted the social norms, right? <laughs> so, yeah. and that's, and I say, cause that was kind of a big deal, right? Yeah. That was kind of a big deal. And um, so, so I think she would, I think she would be pleased, but I will say this as a 53 year old looking at the eight year old, how pleased and inspired I am by her because She didn't even know she was paving the way. She didn't know she'd be the only, you know, Puerto Rican in the gifted class. She didn't know that. And she still, even when she was feeling insecure, pushed hard on that. So I thank her for those lessons too. Well, thank you. And thank you because pushing hard in through discomfort, Mm -hmm. right? And that is so hard to do. And I'm sure some of our leaders out there, emerging leaders, who, you know, whether they're eight or 18 or 28, mm-hmm. right, are, mm-hmm. are thinking, having to think so, through some of those things. So thank you very much for that. Mm-hmm. And I love this phrase, right, um, uh, about champions, not critics, right, really listening to the champions and not the critics, right, or at least listening to them with a critical, critical. Exactly, ear. exactly, right? Like, yeah, because I think it is so easy to be in the I have to work harder. I have to do X. I have to do Y. So what are the critics saying? That volume's going to be there. The problem is it doesn't have to be as high as those who are your champions, right? And like that is what we've built over time is this incredible, of which I'm proud of. I say tribe in a positive way, a tribe that is really supportive that I hope every leader understands is that that's what you need to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And I also really appreciate you talking about that eight year old and being thankful for her because we have to be thankful for ourselves Mm -hmm. all along our own journey. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're going to be at different points along that journey and learning different things. And sometimes we can, in retrospect, beat up on ourselves. And so I appreciate you really talking about how you're thankful for the different parts of the journey. Right. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I just, it's just important for our, our emerging leaders to hear these kinds of things, because I know sometimes, uh, especially if you're sitting in the discomfort, that can be yeah. difficult for sure. Absolutely. So um, my next question is really, 
um, really around this idea of innovation. And you're centered right in that, right? I mean, oh, you yeah. created a doctorate, right? Yeah, yeah. On this, right? yeah. So this is really like leadership mm-hmm. and innovation. Yeah. And, you know, one of the uh, sort of tenets that I work under is when I think about global diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, transformation, mm-hmm. I don't think that you can have innovation without those, right? Like I oh, think I agree. you need, right, no. diversity, inclusion. I know that you, right, I know that we're in agreement here. So as we think about that, right, Tell us a little bit about how you think about, right, especially as you're working with the fund. We're thinking about the future of work, the future of disruption, the future of the city of New York and beyond, yeah. right? Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the site of innovation and that relationship, right, to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, et cetera, principles, right, and how you see those things uh, working together. Yeah, so, so one thing I think is that innovation is cross-generational and cross-sector, right? So when I say cross-generational, the the no holds barred, I am not accepting X of our youngest generation right now is inspiring to me. It holds us 50 somethings accountable in ways you can't imagine, really, in the workplace and everywhere else. And I see that it's not just an issue in the private sector, I see it in the non-for-profit sector as well too, which is, where does innovation come from? It's going to come from a variety of places, right? So I, I think this, this millennial generation, people could, I, I think the assets of it are just this, how do I say this kind of uncompromised ethical stance of what we're supposed to have, right? It's, it's people are tired of it being aspirational. No, it should be in place. And I kind of love that uncompromising because there's a piece of me that has accepted some of the weights on things, right? Maybe whatever, right? We've been around, right? <laughs> but, um, but that's why I love that kind of, so that forcing function that c- crosses into generation is I think really important in innovation. And then the cross-sectoral piece. So much the answers have to, to persisting problems have to go beyond your silo. There's no way that you can do that in one time. Yeah. And so this is where, why, you know, when I think of the office that you've built, Dr. Coleman, you think across those sectors, but that's not common, right? So for what I love about working at the fund is I get to be in my jam space, which is being that kind of generalist and support organizations that are making change, but also be able to broker them across partnerships they wouldn't have thought about before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually think that's where it happens. Mm -hmm. Isolation, uh, innovation doesn't happen with someone alone. I think sometimes that's a romantic narrative of science, Mm -hmm. right? And that's that's fine, right? Uh, And that doesn't mean that that has not happened, right? Someone in a lab alone who's working on it. The truth is when we're talking about the social sector, that some of the most important work right now that are happening regarding criminal justice are across sectors. Right. There's right. no question that that cannot that has to be that way. Um, I was able to be at a ribbon cutting that we were one of the founding um, supporters for is going to be the launching of the first LGBTQ plus museum in New York. That's going to yes. be part of. Yes. Yeah. So the fund was the fiduciary agent that was responsible for getting the funds and all these different people came together. And when I look at that, I'm like saying. Yes, this is where we should have a museum like that. And that museum can only be successful if we are cross race, cross gender and all that. And so going to that ribbon cutting and seeing that all around that blew me away. It was one of those where I was like, yes, this is how we, this is a blueprint for how we have to do this. So what does it mean? It means for us as leaders, when we wanna see more innovation or transformation happen, we can't always create an environment where it's comfortable and neat and expect things to, we, we, we need to do that, right? I need people who are going to challenge me, right? And so, so I probably look at it, I would look at it that way. And I think that lens fits so well, as, a, as I was saying, with the work that you do too across. The, I mean, no surprise, I'm looking out, I look at your microgrants, what are they? It's about getting people, you know that that's where the magic happens, right? So, so there you go. Exactly. And, you know, when you say that the romanticism of science, I always have to remind people that even within the labs, you have others often working right together to produce and to to create new ideas. So that idea of that mythical one person standing alone is a very old idea in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, yeah. That's that individual exceptionalism stuff that's just yeah. not, it's not real. It's and not. to your point, look at COVID. COVID, who thought we'd have pharmaceuticals, research companies all working together, right? Now, of course, some of them have become silent since then, but... <laughs> But, yeah, right. no, but it's but it's true. But there, I think that's another part about innovation is that you don't know the forcing function or the historical moment where it's going to work. Let's look at AIDS. Yes. Who would have thought that we would have ever had, right? Like, just think about it. The gay men's health crisis, act up, philanthropy, pastors, pastors hospitals, people right? All of Haitian uh, descent, right? Exactly. I mean, you had... <laughs> right, the umbrella that required folks to come together to say, hey, we need a response here. Like, so whenever we, whenever I, people lose hope in what could be the future, I lived through the eighties. Yeah. And I, and, yeah. and I feel like, <laughs> right, exactly. And I feel like that's never underestimate the story of AIDS. It would right. Never. And even as it continues today, right? So exactly. very much so. And I also, I want to just go back to a couple of things that you said around, both the cross generation and cross sector, because I think I say this all the time. Sometimes people will frame emerging generations as the problem and not our asset. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. Back to what you said, mm -hmm. and that first of all, they will be your problem if you frame them that way. <laughs> but thing, right. But the second thing is exactly, and I just heard a group of uh, another leader say, get yourself a twelve-year-old or a fifteen-year-old mentor. Right. So that you're getting new information to your point. And I and that I think is just so important. And this cross sector, multi sector government, industry, right, higher ed and the and bringing those players together. So thank you for the great work that you're doing at the fund to thank really you. bring those groups together, because it's so important. And, and unfortunately, not enough people are breaking those silos, I think, currently. And that's what we're going to need, as you said, to deal with yeah. the future of everything. So yeah, yeah. And you know what? I mean, some of it is the political environment of the zero sum, yeah. right? So inherently, competition means x, right? And and I do think that there, there are ways that you could think about expanding the pie in ways that we hadn't thought about before. And, I, and, and that was a perfect example of the vaccine, right? Exactly, yeah. right? One of those, right? Now folks are going back to, you know, they're retrenching, they're going back to this idea of competition. But no, never doubt that if we want to expand the pie, we can. That's so what is the pressure we apply to expand the pie? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I, people keep saying we're going back to the new normal and I say we need a new different and that's about mm -hmm. expanding that pie and thinking that's about right. that pie differently. Mm -hmm. So I can't believe it. We've come to our last question, right. which is really, um, and this is for our emerging leaders as yeah. well. And to think about this idea, it's situated in this idea of mentorship. So given your leadership journey, could you share a piece of advice that you wish you had been given or that you were given? Or and, right during your career that you think, huh, that was something I really am glad I knew. And then the, la the other question is, tell us something that helps to sustain you, that gives you joy. Or is it oh, of yes, absolutely. Oh, I'm happy so, to. Talk to me about those. Okay, great. So the, the first in thinking about mentorship, I think what I, what I learned early is that, you know, sometimes we over romanticize the notion of mentor, that they're going to be A through Z for you right? And some mentors are seasonal and man, are, and that, and there is nothing wrong with that. That was wonderful. Like that person was transformative for me in my early twenties, but they may not be the person that I carry beyond that. That doesn't mean we don't stay friends, but, but I think that's an important piece because I think this idea that, and, and I think the other part is that um, separating, and I, I love this too, things that people want to do for you as sponsors versus mentors, right? I call them the credibility messengers, right? There are people who are going to do that. They're just going to say, you know, there's someone, you know, I'll meet a young person. They'll say, oh, you're going to be my mentor. I said, you know what? No, I'm going to take you to this luncheon with me. And you're going to meet eight other very powerful <laughs> women. And, that, and that's what I have time to do. And, you know, you're going to make up what you, you, you get my idea. But I think that this idea that, that you need both and that that's okay. And that's a good thing. And that life is made up of that. So that don't, don't put constraints or uh, boundaries around what mentoring or sponsoring means. Actually kind of go with that. I think the last bit of um, advice someone gave me, and this was probably more gendered, which was um, don't be afraid to own your accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that, and I think in, in some cases, yeah, I've, 
I'm much more there now, right? Um, but I would, I would say there was a while there I wouldn't. I was like, and, and someone said, well, why, why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you pushing for that recognition? And I realized, I was like, oh, you're right. That's not, not doing myself a favor. I'm not, but the person said to me, which was wonderful, said, you're not doing other people a favor because they see themselves in you. And that was a real powerful message to me around people need to feel that things are accessible to them because they see it in you if you're accessible, right? So, so those were the messages. So what do I do to keep myself sane? You know, um, I love to travel. I do not, I have a wonderful partner in my life that I've traveled this journey with. His name is Greg. I have a teenager right now. His name is Gabriel. <laughs> we'll leave it there. But things that I do, I don't apologize for having to do things that fuel me independently. So I need Lizette time. Yeah. And so that, that could be me just going away for 48 hours and reading for 48 hours. It might not sound like fun to someone else, but to me, that is the best gift I could give myself. So every now and then, I kind of do that. And, and let me tell you, it took a while to do that in a Latino family and culture where you're always together, where the expectations are always hosting and socializing and taking care of others, that to pull away intentionally, uh, you know, I had to confront some of my own um, deprogramming I had to do <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, and I love music. Anything that involves live music, I truly believe it's restorative. So there you go. There's actually research about listening to music and how it helps keep your mind active, et cetera. So I'm sure you're familiar with that, but it's really, really important. And of course, taking the time for yourself. I think far too many of us, right, especially given our cultural, social right. backgrounds and also our gender backgrounds That's sometimes, right? right? It's mm -hmm. about caregiving and thinking yes. about how we care for ourselves. And, and taking that time for yourself is just, I think, so crucial. And the distinction between sponsors and mentors yeah. and this idea of seasonal mentors, I, I so appreciate that because I think so, so many times we think it's mentorship in perpetuity. I know, right? for life. <laughs> for, for life, life right? <laughs> and that's yeah. not usually how it is. And, right. um, and this idea of sponsors. So I, I appreciate you talking about how you take women to different events or young leaders, because I think sometimes people don't understand that just putting, getting someone in right. the right room to the right table to meet others is, a, is an amazing opportunity that is very much about that idea of sponsorship. And I know that's something that you do, Dr. Coleman, all the time too, right? Like, like that's the idea that there is, I never buy in to that trope that only one of us needs to be there, right? <laughs> this is about the expanded pie, That's right? Exactly you know how I expand right. the pie? I take advantage of my plus, my plus one, sometimes make it plus two. Right? There's room for all of us. That's right. More. That's right. Yeah. Oh, this has just been a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. Thank you to our entire audience who's out there and for everyone who's come to, to hear this conversation. I hope that you continue to take really good care, Dr. Davis, and continue the incredible work that you're doing. To the audience, we hope that you continue to follow the Office of Global Inclusion for more transformation talks, as well as updates, events, and our other programs and resources that we make available to you all through our listservs and websites. So we hope that you will sign up and join us for additional events. Thank you again for joining us today, and please continue to take very good care. Thank you as well. It was an honor to be here. <laughs>